the Midwest supporting, bruiser loving, positivity spreading, world's most dangerous podcast. Join former pro wrestler and promoter Dave Dynasty as he supports and promotes Midwest pro wrestling. Keep on growing with the Midwest Express. This is the Dave Dynasty Show. Greetings and welcome to the Dave Dynasty Show. This is your host, Dave Dynasty. Thank you for joining us. How are you doing? It is a uh, feat of nature. Here we are getting an episode out on time. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I will accept all laurels in the form of cash donations to the show. Thank you very much. <laughs> we are glad that you joined us, however you do, whether it be on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, or any of the other platforms. Whichever way you do, please like, share, subscribe, comment, etc., etc. And if you're looking for a way to get in touch with us, visit DaveDynasty.com, where you can find all of our past episodes, as well as all of our social media links. Uh, we got a great show for you today. We have an interview with uh, Nitro, Bill Monahan, a guy I've chat with uh, quite a bit, uh, has a deep love of the WWA and Bruiser Bedlam. Uh, we have a lot of common uh, common interest there. Uh, he's a big fan of Dr. Jerry Graham Jr., the great Wojo, etc., as am I. So a great uh, interview there that Ike did with uh, Monahan. Uh, look forward to that. We also have a whatever happened to with the California kid. If you are in central Indiana, or actually just in the general Midwest, but I'm from central Indiana. Uh, back in, oh gosh, I mean, I guess it'd be some, it's sometime in the 90s. Uh, you saw the California kid all over the place. He was also known as Brett Gunn. Uh, had a lot of similarities physically in his looks of Billy Gunn. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he's a, was a great guy, great worker, great talent, uh, in the ring, had a, a great look, and, uh, it was very, very cool, uh, talking to him, catching up to him. Uh, he just, uh, as of last night before recording this, uh, returned to the ring, had a match. I think it was just a one-off, but still, uh, good to see him, uh, still have that fire, that love for the business. I uh, know it was great talking to him. He's got some great stories to tell. Uh, as does most people in the Midwest, uh, he has some Rip Rogers stories, but don't, don't we all? Uh, <laughs> good old Rip. And then we also will continue, uh, the quest for Steiner. As we know, last week we started that I am on a mission to land an interview with Scott Steiner. Uh, it is a daunting task. It seemed, uh, seemed like it was dead in the water to begin with, but I'm up for the challenge. I'm up to continue on. I did try to reach out and make initial contact with Scott uh, in the form of a text message just to get a filler up. I haven't heard any response. It's been several days now, no response. So I don't know whether the text did not get to him or whether he is just ignoring me. It's probably some mixture of the two. Uh, fingers still crossed, though, that I do hear back. Um, I know he continues to say, has said that he does not do podcasts for people he does not know. But I'm hoping that maybe he'd reconsider, given our angle here, given our, our Midwest connection, uh, the connection with Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. I'm hoping maybe he will give us, at least hear me out. But like I said, I have not heard back from him. Uh, so, I don't know. We'll see what happens. But I'm going to continue on this quest. Uh, because, if nothing else, it is a fun way for us to revisit some wacky and crazy Scott Steiner interviews. And you know that there are plenty out there. Uh, so we've got one here today uh, that Scott did, and we're going to play that. Uh, and after that, we are going to go and kick it to Referee Man Bun for official decision. And before we do that, though, here is Scott Steiner, our uh, Quest for Steiner Audio of the Week. Enjoy. We heard Hot Man of Love to Party. Well, he's right. So we went down to this club called Tiny Groove, and this freak comes up to me and says she's been looking for love in all the wrong places. I didn't know what the hell a lot of things to say to me, so I look in her eyes. I say, I might not know how to love you, but I damn know sure how to touch you. So why don't you quit lusting it and let me bust it? So I took her back to my place and I gave her this feeling that I knew she hit the ceiling and she called me the big bad booty daddy. He is the greatest man alive. So this goes to all my freaks out there. Big Papa Pump, you can hook up, holler, and you hear me. One, two, three. Here's my man bun. 
Hello, beautiful people, and welcome to another edition of Official Decision with Referee Man Bun. I'm Referee Man Bun, also known as Referee Sean O'Brien. I worked on two shows this week. Uh, IWA Mid-South ran its weekly Thursday show, which saw a shocking ending uh, in the main event of that one. Mance Warner, unfortunately... Uh, lost his title to uh, the big, bad, nasty Calvin Tankman. Those two put on a hell of a match. Uh, but in the end, Tankman took out Mance with a chair and uh, and hit him with a big pile driver on the, on the chair and took him out. It was unfortunate. Um, the crowd, their entire, the whole crowd's jaw was on the floor. It was, it was an interesting turn of events. Uh, nobody was ready for it. <laughs> I guess that's how. <laughs> That's how it goes sometimes, you know, good old pro wrestling. Um, I also made my debut for a company in West Virginia called Vicious Outcast Wrestling. Uh, if you're a fan of the more hardcore style of wrestling, then definitely check out this company. Uh, they do some of the wildest stipulations with one of the craziest rosters in the main event. It was uh, Dale Patrick's against G Raver in a basically like a pits of glass type match. It was uh, panes of glass all over the ring. It was a wild match, so uh, definitely check them out on social media for more info on how to watch uh, as soon as that event drops and how to see any of uh, of their events from the past. I got a lot of positive feedback on uh, on last week's segment of the officials' decision, so we're going to do this episode kind of similar. Uh, this week we are talking tag team wrestling. Uh, I recently polled a few listeners, and uh, one of the most popular topics was. Uh, the rules of a tag team contest. So let's go ahead and break down one specific uh, rule in a tag team contest. That particular rule, what is a proper tag? Well, according to the WWE rule book, because of course that's the law of the land, the following are required for a legal tag. Both feet of the wrestler must be uh, must be flat on the apron. They must also have a hold of the tag rope Or the top turnbuckle if there isn't a tag rope. Tags are legal when the two tag team members make contact. Let me say that again for Drucifer. Tags are legal when the two tag team members make contact. That's all that's required. So that means that, yes, Drucifer, a Canadian tag is legal. Shout out to a friend of the podcast, Drucifer Tweets from Road Home from Wrestling. Check out those guys. They do a great podcast on uh, indie wrestling in the Midwest. But yes, a Canadian tag is legal. Finally, the official has to see or hear the teammates making contact in order for the tag to be legal. If you know tag team wrestling, sometimes that uh, particular um, rule can muddy the waters a little bit in a tag team match. So hopefully you have learned something today about the great sport of pro wrestling and tag team wrestling in specific. Uh, If you have any more pro pro wrestling related rule uh, questions, um, please send them on over. You can hit me up on social media or you can hit up Dave Dynasty and send the questions to him and he'll get them over to me. Uh, Either way, they will get to me and I will get your questions answered as soon as possible. Coming up this week, IWA Mid-South is running an all-women's tournament to crown a new women's champion. So that will be very, very exciting. That takes place on April 19th. Also, IWA Mid-South this week is holding its annual Chris Candido Tag Team Tournament on Friday, April 20th. Also this week, I will be making my debut for Revolution Championship Pro Wrestling in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And I will also be at Heroes and Legends 10 on Saturday, April 21st. Uh, it's a stacked card. Uh, check check out the Heroes and Legends card if you haven't seen it. Um, there's all kinds of people on there. Uh, one of the, the big appearances, um, Hall of Famer Mark Henry, uh, 2018 Hall of Famer Mark Henry. Um, so hope to see you guys at any and all of these shows. Um, and if not, then check them out after they drop on the internet. Uh, shout out to Dave Dynasty, as always, for having me on here. Uh, You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at OfficialSPO502. Also on Facebook by searching Sean Patrick O'Brien. It's S-E-A-N. It's the Irish way. Uh, Thanks for listening. I hope you have a good week. You've heard him here on the Dave Dynasty Show as a guest and as host of the monthly Graham's Gallery episodes. And now you can hear his stories 
you can own a copy of Confessions of a Big Time Wrestler, the audio book from Dr. Jerry Graham Jr., former multi-tag team champion in WWA and owner of Bruiser Bedlam. You can hear all of his encounters with the various wrestlers, places, and promotions he's worked as he tells about his colorful, long, and illustrious career. You can have your own copy for only $25, and that includes shipping and handling. It's very simple. Go on Facebook, look up Jerry Jaffe, J-A-F-F-E, send him a private message, and make arrangements to purchase a copy of Confessions of a Big Time Wrestler now. You will not regret this purchase. And welcome back to the Dave Dynasty Show. I'm your co-host, Ike Isaacs, and today I am joined by yet again on another amazing guest. We have Phil Nitro Monahan. How are we doing tonight? Good. How are you doing? Hey, I'm, I'm doing. I'm doing the doing. You know what I mean? Got to hustle to be a hustler. Um, I can't, of yeah. course. <laughs> but, uh, all right, well, we're going to go ahead and jump to start this interview. We started off a little late. That's my bad. I'm kind of a late person just generally but first question as always phil where are you from uh, i'm from a little town called Walden, michigan right right over the ohio uh border it's about i'm gonna say 20 minutes from indiana so it's not really far so it, it borders both states michigan does right there so i'm real close oh, absolutely yeah you're real close to a, a lot of corn and a lot of uh, a lot of un, un, unsultry things about the Indiana ways. No, I'm kidding, uh, <laughs> but uh, well, I live on a dirt road, you know, so I'm secluded and surrounded by cornfields and bean fields and whatever else. So I kind of I kind of like it though. No, yeah, they're not wrong with that. Being secluded keeps you away from all the crazy people most of the time. <laughs> unless, most of the time, most of the time. And, unless you are the crazy people, which very well may be the case. Is that right? <laughs> I've been, I've been called that before. <laughs> hey, you know, there's nothing wrong with that either. A little weirdness never hurt nobody. But um, nope. uh, so did you grow up uh, in that area as well? Yeah, yeah, I lived here all my life. Absolutely. Um, so what was it like growing up there? Uh, you play any sports when you were younger? Yeah, um, I played every sport. Um, I went to high school. I didn't play much baseball uh, when I got older, but um played basketball and football. Um, all through school, so and was recruited by a couple colleges, small colleges out of high school for football, but uh, that was not to be. Absolutely. Um, so, so obviously, uh, I'm assuming what was to be was professional wrestling. <clears throat> yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, it ended up being professional wrestling. Um, I did go to another house, but uh, that wasn't for any um, athletics or anything. Um, but yeah, uh, everything just fell together. It's, it's weird because one of the colleges that recruited me was in Angola, Indiana, and actually where I, that's where I seen my first independent, uh, wrestling event. And my trainer was just down the road from Angola in Waterloo, Indiana. So there's a lot of tie-ins right there. Absolutely. Um, so then, uh, so then with wrestling, obviously, like you said, you know, this whole sports thing wasn't meant to be. You were going to be a wrestler. Um, was that something that you were predetermined to be when you kind of went into them? Um, did you like wrestling as a kid? Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up watching wrestling, and there really wasn't uh, – not like my dad watched wrestling. It was just kind of a fluke channel surfing as a young kid and seen it and – uh really caught my eye. I didn't know my grandpa was a, a wrestling fan, but I really, you know, I didn't know that. Um, he wasn't a hardcore wrestling fan, I would say, but just, um, you know, he'd watch it if it was on or, or, you know, a little bit of it. But, uh, so it was kind of, a, kind of just a fluke. And after I seen my first, um, show, I was always looking for it. We got, we got kind of hooked on it. Absolutely. Uh, that's always a good way to get started is, you know, just channel surfing. That's kind of how I got started. I mean, obviously, you know, my family's really big into wrestling, so it's kind of always about it, but 
you know, one day I remember I, I hadn't watched wrestling for forever, but I just channel surfed and it was during the Attitude Era. And I, I remember I caught a snippet of an episode and I saw the Hardy Bros and all these other guys. And I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I can. I was actually watching with, that I channel surfed too. And it was uh, Tito Santana and Greg Valentine in a cage. And oh, wow. uh, that was that was the first one. Yeah, yeah. And then the second one, channel surfing again, I caught was some AWA stuff with, um, I think it was uh, Doug Summers and Buddy Rose against the Rock uh, Midnight Rockers. I think, I'm pretty sure that's who it was. But, uh, yeah. So that was my second one. Both of them were kind of bloody bouts. So it was, it was uh, definitely... Definitely got me hooked. And then, of course, I've got to um, real close to Toledo area. Toledo's about 45 minutes from me. So we got the WWA from Toledo on, and that was around the same time the WWF Superstars was on. So, you know, we got to see Dr. Jerry Graham, Great Wojo, Scott Rex Steiner, Bulldog Don Ken, Calypso Jim, all those guys. So there was no shortage of wrestling on local TV back then. No, absolutely. I, I definitely feel like that was probably like the golden age for wrestling on TV because it seems like there was so much, just so much yeah. material, so much product to kind of engulf yourself with. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, definitely, you know, you, you, you kind of, uh, it's kind of like a, a stair step. You, you start out as a, as a fan channel surfing. You turn into the guy who's going to the indie shows. And then eventually you're, you know, figuring out, well, how do I get, how does this become part of my life? So, how was it yeah. that you kind of made that transition from fan to actual wrestler? Well, you know, I back then there was not a whole lot of indie shows that I knew about. Um, we're talking right around 1995, 1996, before the indie explosion where everybody could get a ring and any, everybody could be a promoter and everybody could be a wrestler. So that was, you know, there was still a couple uh, people hanging on the territories back then. Um, you know, because uh, when I broke in, there was a lot of uh, Dick the Bruisers guys that I broke in with. Yeah. So uh, totally different. But so I only went to like a couple independent shows that I knew about. One was in Detroit and one was at Buck Lake Ranch in Angola. And that's where I met uh, my trainer, Jay Bowers, a.k.a. the Bounty Hunter. And uh, we got to talking back. He um Thought I size and the next week um, I started training down in Waterloo twice a week. Wow. So, and, and that's the weird yeah. thing too is that I mean yeah, you think about it, it's like modern wrestling you can just email a school or message them on Facebook and back then it was like you had to just chance upon it and then go from there. Yes, yes, and it was it was harder to get to, into and it was definitely more of a. Uh, secret of society, so to speak, you know, um, and it's totally different. And I talked to some of my, my, uh, friends that I still talk to from back in those days and like locker rooms were so different. And, and it's funny because, um, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had the Godfather in for one of our shows and he was just talking how when he goes to WWE, it's totally different from what it, what it was. He says it's just not as fun anymore. Um, you know, when I broke in, guys were in the back smoking, chewing, you know, drinking a beer here and there, playing cards or whatever. Now I go to shows and everybody's stretching out and, you know, on their games and taking their protein shakes and, you know what I mean? It's totally <laughs> different now, you know, so it's definitely not what I, what I, um, grew up with and what I broke into. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, speaking of when you kind of broke in, um, obviously, you know, uh, training was also probably a lot different back then. You know, the idea of kayfabe was still alive. Um, there was still a lot that you learned. So what was your training like um, kind of in comparison to how wrestling is today? Um, I mean, the, we didn't have a strict regimen of, you know, of drills or anything else when we started training. You know, um, of course, you know, learn how to bump, learn how to run the ropes. And um, the bumping, I didn't catch on to as quick, but uh, everything else, 
pretty much, and he'd make me run the ropes, and, you know, uh, just, it was, it came very, very natural to me, so, um, there was, we just move on from one thing, from lock up to, you know, then we're doing arm bars, and wrist locks, and how to get in and out of them, and, you know, how to sell, and, and, what and stuff like that and back then if you, you weren't selling they'd make you sell so <laughs> you know um so and i guess that's probably one of the reasons that i have such a hard time when i start when i've tried to get people to train i haven't had much of a success rate because i'm kind of old school you know i'm not gonna uh you know it's not gonna be easy and you know i'm gonna get hit hard and I'm gonna sometimes and i'm just not you know, it's hard for me to, to, to train people if, if they're not going to be as committed as I am. You know what I mean? And do the things that I had to do back in the day. So, no, absolutely. I, I think that kind of uh, speaks to that testament of the divide, if that, if you will. It, it kind of um, it kind of shows like the major key differences between how training is now and how it is then. It also kind of shows those differences, to, you know, how people take on to wrestling. I mean, like you said, uh, you, you learned to sell because if you didn't, it, you got hurt. <laughs> Whereas nowadays, yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, nowadays, no selling is like a gimmick. I mean, you can no sell in a match. And nobody gives, you know, nobody gives to, they don't. yeah. <laughs> yeah. No one cares. I mean, it's, a lot of this new wrestling is like the spot fest wrestling, you know, and, and, or the strong style stiff, the sh you know, crap out of each other wrestling. And, you know, it's just changed so much. Right. If, if some of these guys have done this stuff back in the day, uh, it would have been ugly. Well, some of them wouldn't even be in the business, but. <laughs> That's for sure. And I'm not hating on anything. Everything, everything, um, morphs, everything morphs into something else, you know, everything grows and changes so i'm not i'm not hating on it i hope it doesn't come across like that i'm just speaking from my own you know how it's changed for me and stuff so no absolutely i mean i i've, I've talked to a lot of people who kind of have that similar mentality and i definitely don't think it's coming across as like hateful i think it's more of like you know this is how it used to be i i understand it's changed but you know it's it, this is how it used to be type deal mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it doesn't mean I have to like it, but, <laughs> right. you know. Right. But, uh, so maybe just to kind of uh, put these put the train back on the rails. Um, so, obviously, you went from training, you did your thing, and then you went on to wrestling eventually. Uh, but do you mm -hmm. remember your first match? Do you remember what that was like? Yeah, uh, it was actually in my hometown, like six months after I started, and it was a battle royal. And I was like freaked out, nervous. So, <laughs> yes, I, I do remember it very well. Absolutely. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I, I mean, it, I think it's fair to say that a lot of people I talked to, one of their first matches was a battle royal. I feel like that's a that's a first match for about everybody. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then uh, maybe to touch on your name and your gimmick a little bit, because obviously when I introduced introduce you and your Phil Nitro Monahan. Uh, but mm -hmm. when you, in your early career, um, if I'm not mistaken, you went just as Nitro. Is that right? Yeah, and like even before that, uh, my partner, the Bounty Hunter, we wrestled as a tag team um, called the Bounty Hunters, and um, he was Buck Lawless, and I was JB Lawless, and uh, the Dark the Dark Angel managers for a while. Um, but uh, we were. Shoot, we were on the road every weekend, you know, three days a week. Um, back then, just super busy. It was, it was uh, definitely a learning experience. Uh, yeah, so we, I was JB Lawless. He was Buck Lawless. We were the Lawless clan. And then after we, um, you know, we stopped tagging or whatever, and I went my direction, and uh, that's where the Nitro, the Nitro came in. I started tag teaming with my brother who had gotten into the business at this point, and uh, we were called Mayhem, and he was he was Chainsaw, and I was Nitro, so. Absolutely. Um, so definitely a lot, of, a lot of tag team experience uh, in your career, is that fair to say? Yeah. Um, matter of fact, uh, when I was tagging with um, Jay, uh, we started doing some tag team with Bill Eady, 
and um, Bill actually, uh, we we did the demolition gimmick with him, with Bill. So uh, we did demolition, and then Bill, when he was on the road, um, I actually got to do some things on the road with Bill as demolition for quite a while out in the Midwest and Pennsylvania and Ohio and a couple different areas. So so that was that was really cool to be demolition with the original demolition axe. I mean, that's where I learned. The, the top two that I've learned from is like axe and uh, Jay. You know, Jay taught me the basics and then axe showed me how to, you know, be a worker and how to work and, and to get your character over. Yeah, absolutely. So obviously that was a very beneficial experience, I would imagine, to get into kind of, uh, uh, get, they get to get kind of that, uh, what's the word I would look to say it, it's like uh, getting taken, not necessarily under their wing, but kind of getting that experience and that knowledge from them was probably pretty beneficial for your career, I'd imagine. Yeah, because, like, growing up as a kid, like, Demolition was my favorite tag team. So that would be, like, if you're a Indianapolis Colts fan growing up and then you get drafted by the Colts, you know, even if it's for a short while, you know what I mean? It's like your dream come true. So I've been beyond blessed that I've had that opportunity to, you know, do the face paint and, and the spikes and the helmet and walk out to the music and, you know, to be accepted to do that. So that was awesome. It's probably one of my highlights. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, kind of another step along the way. I mean, obviously you've probably you've done quite a bit in your career. You did all kinds of things. Um, but, you know, one of the things about wrestling these days, I feel like, um, is, I mean, especially independent wrestling, obviously the WWE has always had its fame and its fortune. Uh, but independent, independent wrestling, like right now, uh, is especially, like, explosive, I feel like. So since, mm-hmm. since you're still part of it, since you still see the inside, you still see the depths, and you've also been a part of it for a long time, what would you say, in your opinion, is the best and worst thing about independent wrestling? Um, the best thing about it, um, is for good independent wrestling, good independent wrestling is a great alternative to what you see on TV and it's a great family experience as long as it's good independent wrestling. Um, and what was, what was the other part of the question? I lost my train of thought there. (laughs) No, right. Uh, so that's the good part, but what's the worst part, do you think, about independent wrestling? The worst part is there's a lot of bad independent wrestling. You know, okay. there's terrible. And, and and unfortunately for us, and I try to preach this, um, if you're an independent company coming into a town and when and you're not on TV, you're not WWE, unfortunately as an independent company, we all get lumped together. So if you see a really crappy show and then you see another show coming in, you're like, yeah, I went to one of those, you know, that's not WWE. Or, you know, the fan, the fans like to call it that are the uneducated people, you know, like, they call it the amateur wrestling or the, you know, semi-pro wrestling or, you know what I mean? So they'll lump us together and they'll be like, yeah, we already seen one of those, those semi-pro shows. They're terrible. I'm not going. When it could be great because I've had so many people come to one of our shows and be like, wow, that was, that was totally awesome. And, uh, you know, you guys totally, I wasn't expecting to see that, you know? So you guys, you know, you guys really did a great job. So it's a very, that's probably the worst part is that we all get lumped together. No, absolutely. Uh, you know, that's actually something I've I've had at length conversation with people about is that, you know, anybody can, you know, throw up a ring, put together some guys and call themselves a wrestling promoter, call their promotion, the wrestling promotion. And, you know, like you said, I mean, everybody's kind of lumped together. So these people who are just kind of, you know, for lack of a better term, half-assing it, they kind of get lumped together with people who are really just putting forth the work, trying to get a good promotion. And, but they get a bad rap because of X, Y, or Z company, which, which obviously sucks. <laughs> Yeah, because it's not uncommon to go into a town and try to get a building and people be like, yeah, we already did that wrestling thing and, and it was, you know, they did this to the building, it didn't work out or whatever, you know what I mean? Left a bad taste in their mouth and then you can't, you know, you're screwed. 
Absolutely. And as soon as they get that bad taste, it's really hard to get it out because, like you said, they've they've experienced it once and they didn't experience the real deal. You know. Yep. But yep. Absolutely. Another one of the benefits, though, I guess, of independent wrestling is that um, you get to have those, you know, situations where you get to meet your idols. Like you said, you got to meet Demolition. Um, but what was it like to also meet people that you idolize, such as, like, you've already kind of mentioned, like, the Great Wojo or Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. What was it like getting to be around these people during that time? Um, I mean, that, that was on, a, on the same level um, surreal because, like, watching, you know, Jerry Graham and then actually working for Dr. Graham, in Toledo and being his top guy, you know, in, in PCW for a couple of years back, you know, a couple of years ago, I was a heavyweight champion for him. And that was kind of like, wow. Um, you know, we did an angle where I was getting hurt and I suggested, I suggested, well, why don't we just make it look like I'm really out and, and take me off, you know, take me out for a couple of months. And he told me I was too valuable to be, you know, off of TV and that kind of just, that was one of the greatest compliments I ever, you know, I ever got. So I was like, okay. I mean, so it's really surreal to see that, you know, who the top guys were back then and for, for, uh, you know, Doc to give you the ball and, and run with it, you know, now. So it's, like I said, it's, it's kind of surreal. And I don't, you know, unfortunately a lot of guys don't realize the history and the experience and, and all that when they're around guys like Doc and, you know, Bobo, and they don't take them up on, you know, it, it's like a fountain of knowledge. It's right there, so go to it, you know, take a cup. But, you know, yeah. sadly, that, that doesn't happen. Oh, yeah. And that's actually another thing I want to talk to you about. I mean, obviously, the Dave Dynasty show is, I mean, I personally think that we do this, but we're pretty dedicated to, like, making sure that Midwest wrestling history is not forgotten. I feel like it's oftentimes overlooked, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. So what do you think the importance of preserving and sharing Midwest wrestling history, uh, what do you think the, how big the importance of that is? Uh, tell us about what your thoughts on that, basically. Like how important it is to preserve our history as Midwest wrestling. Uh, I definitely think it's, it's very important um, because you're right. Um, there's not a lot of it that gets – you know, the props that it's due, you know, we had, we had the Sheik with big time wrestling and that was huge back in the day. And he had Dick the Bruiser with WWA wrestling, which was huge back in the day. And these were, were world renowned stars. But, you know, after that, they kind of just, I think that they think wrestling just dropped off the map because when you go through wrestling history or watch document documentaries on it, they're all talking about Florida championship wrestling, Georgia championship wrestling, Memphis. You know, they're always talking about down south or up in the northeast or out in Los Angeles. The, the south gets the majority of it, but, you know, the Midwest is rarely ever, ever mentioned. So I think that's it's important because there's a lot of, a lot of good wrestlers that have come out of the Midwest, and it does have a, a rich history. I'm definitely appreciative that someone is, is, you know, trying to trying to keep it alive for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, and I agree. You know, it, it, it sounds bad, but I think, I, I mean, I think especially, obviously, a lot of people probably are like this, but I kind of have a unique perspective because I was born in the 90s. So obviously I'm, I'm, I'm still young and I'm only in my 20s. So I wasn't around for the real Midwest wrestling. I wasn't around for the Bruiser era or – you know, any of that. So me getting to interview mm -hmm. people who were around during this time and, you know, getting to see all these stories and, you know, the, all this stuff is, it's kind of mind blowing. Cause I'm like, so you're telling me that some of the greatest wrestlers of all time wrestled in my hometown years before I was born, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I Now see, I wasn't around a lot. I mean, I did see a little bit of Dick the Bruiser when I was a kid, you know, on the WWA program. Because I was born in 1976, so that heyday was coming to an era. But I am very, uh, I'm an astute student of wrestling, so I wanted to know, you know, look up the history. I, you know, I follow. I, I had to look to see what what it was before to what it is, you know, to 
to make it. So I, you know, studied a lot of, you know, what, what's around. And I've talked to so many of the guys. Like I said, when I came in, I was working with a lot of guys that had worked with Bruiser. So sitting back and just listening to stories, you can learn a whole bunch. No, oh, absolutely. And that's uh, one of the most important things about preserving history is stories. And boy, oh boy, oh boy, have I heard many stories. <laughs> oh, I bet. I mean, that's I bet. That, that's probably one of the greatest things too is that all these stories they have like a they have a unique they, they all they all have a unique perspective. Everybody I talk to has a perspective, and it's just you know it, it's pretty incredible to see it all. But another thing as well, kind of with I mean, you kind of personally, I mean. With everything you've done, I mean, again, it's all about the stories. It's all about the perspective. But with everything you've done, I, I mean, I imagine that you probably have a lot of highlights, but just maybe to get a little a little mm-hmm. more of a sense of where your mind is with this, but what would you say the top highlight of your career so far is being a part of Midwest Wrestling? Oh, boy. That's <laughs> really, really hard. That's a hard question because – like I said, I've been fortunate and blessed enough for so many opportunities that I've got to do. Um, you know, shoot. Um, that, that's, that's put me on the spot with that one. <laughs> I knew it was coming though, but, um, let me, I mean, they can all, all, all the highlights are just, oh boy, unbelievable. Like winning the NWA national championship three times. That yeah. was huge. That's huge for me. Um, there's not a lot of people that can say they did that. And, you know, I share that with one of my mentors, Bill Eady, the Mass Superstars. He did it. Um, winning the NWA Midwest Championship, that was another one. Um, uh, wrestling uh, Kushida from New Japan for the NWA, that was that was a big one. Uh Boy, being in the road, being against the Road Warriors in Chicago with my brother, you know, in Chicago was pretty huge. Uh, shoot, you know, and outside of the Midwest, going going wrestling in Japan a couple times, wrestling in Germany, being able to wrestle in Korea, Hawaii, and Guam, Alaska. I mean, those are all. I, I it's hard to pick one, you know, one highlight. So then it's it's safe to say that your career was your highlight then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and I still strap them on and, and, and go to town, you know, but uh, not very often, you know. So, but yeah, yeah, I can't, I say the only thing that kind of sucked was I never really um, got a WWE thing, you know, even be there. Uh, but it's a lot easier now for people. You know, my one of my um, students just made it on there, uh, Shayla Hyde. Russell's Joan King and Nia Jax squashed you last Monday, so that was a good thing. <laughs> so, uh, but I mean, that's that's probably my only thing that I never got to. When WCW was still around, uh, my partner on and I were talking about you know being a, being on a taping, and then they sold, and everybody that had any contacts there pretty much lost them. So. <laughs> all the good old days. <laughs> all the good old days, yeah. Your company's getting sold now. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I suppose that is one of the drawbacks. But I feel like, you know, someone of your stature with your career and your accolades, I feel like not being in the WWE kind of makes you even more – I guess makes your career a little more illustrious is because you didn't need the WWE to get to where you were. You basically did it just appearing on indie shows and basically just appearing using your own talents rather than using, and obviously I'm not saying this is what people do, but you didn't have the WWE to amplify you or boost you per se. You just did it all on your own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I stayed busy and I traveled, and like I said, I got booked overseas and I didn't need that. So, you know, that's I guess that's got to say something. I, I, sh- I sure as hell hope it would. <laughs> but, yeah, and, and, and but let me clarify on like, getting booked overseas because I know a lot of guys right now pay for their own flights and, and then they count it as making it. But, you know, if that's the route they got to take, cool for them. But, you know, all mine were, were paid and I was paid, flown over and, and this and that. I don't know if that's going to ruffle any feathers because if that's the way they, they do it, fine. But, 
you know, um, getting my Ribera jacket while I was in Japan was a highlight. So that's like a, um, you know, your baptism in wrestling when you get one of those. So absolutely. <laughs> Uh, and hopefully that doesn't ruffle any feathers. But if it does, you know, don't really care that much, do we? No kidding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it just is what it is. I mean, a lot of guys, some people don't respect that. I mean, if you're going over there to train and take a chance of something, go for it, you know. I'm just saying there's just a little bit of a difference yeah. if you're, you know, paid to go and, and they pay for your flight and get you over there. So I ain't hating. It's everybody's got their own way. I'm just, that's one of the ways the business has changed, so. Absolutely. No, I agree. Uh, so I guess kind of a, to wind down a little bit, just to get a little more about you, but um, obviously, like you said, I mean, it's it's only 2018. We still got life in us. Um, so do you have any goals for 2018, you know, the last seven months or so, or however much time we have left in 2018? Oh, boy, I don't really, I mean... You know, I don't really have any goals. I'm, I'll probably run a couple shows here and there, you know, and get in the ring and, you know, do do something. Like I said, I'm not – I wrestle about once a month now, Yeah. if that. So it's kind of nice to have my weekends freed up. My kids are getting older and, you know, playing sports and stuff. So, but, uh, you know, that, that's that's pretty much – I did a, um, a tag match with my 10-year-old last summer, and uh, that was really fun. So uh, that's my next my next step, I guess, is to get him ready for when his time comes. So I can't totally quit until, you know, he gets established. No, absolutely. Um, so then, uh, speaking of which, do you have any events coming up uh, that are worth noting? Anything in the near future that you'd like to just pitch out there if anybody wants to see you? Um, you know, um, sometimes I go over to Powerbomb Wrestling and hang out. Once in a while, I'm not an active competitor there, but I go down there because it's close and I get to see people. Um, other, and I've got a couple shows coming up this summer in Flint, Michigan, where I'm actually putting them on at the city market up there for their summer summer days. So, but um, other than that, I'm just kind of seeing, you know, what my next move is, where I'm gonna, you know, try to get a show at. So that's mm-hmm. that's about it. Absolutely. Um, so last thing for you, um, do you have any social media where fans can follow you if they can, uh, you know, see what's going on in the, in the life and, uh, see what all's happening next for you? Um, pretty much just my, like Facebook, Phil Monahan on Facebook. Uh, I have a nitro page on Facebook as well. And there's a Legion page for, um, me and my partner Malice, um, those are those are pretty much it. I haven't updated those ones in a long time because I haven't been doing anything. But uh, yeah, that's that's pretty. I got an Instagram as well. So, but other than that, that's that's about it. Absolutely. Well, you guys know where to go find them. Uh, you know, it's uh, you know the Facebooks, the Twitters, and all the social medias, the Google machine, if you will. Um, <laughs> you know where to you see him if you know if he's hanging out. Like you said, Power Bomb Wrestling. You know he's got a He's got. He goes and hangs out there sometimes. So if you want to go see him, you know where to see him. If you want to go get him on uh, social medias, you know where to go do that. Um, but you know, Phil, I want to thank you for coming on here, uh, t- taking the time to tell us about your, you know, your life, your career, and uh, letting us get to know you a little bit better. It's uh, definitely an honor and a pleasure getting to talk to you today. Yeah, I'd love to do it again anytime. Just let me know. Give me a call. Absolutely, we're gonna have to. Especially if you got a kid coming up in wrestling, we're gonna have to. He keeps some tabs on him. Hopefully, hopefully he uh, gets up there, and we're able to uh, interview him one day too. Absolutely, you get a chance. Go check it out. Uh, the mat. We actually did two matches. Um, it's Pro Wrestling Media Outlet. A uh, girl named Julia Hoff does it, um, and she is great. Um, but check it out, Pro Wrestling Media Outlet. And they've got a bunch of different videos on there and the, the match with me and my kids on there. It's already got like 2,500 2, views, 2,600 views. So that's pretty cool. Well, then our personal goal is to up that view count. So you guys heard it. We're probably going to have a future interview already booked up for you. <laughs> so we got that on the book. <laughs> uh, but, again, I just want to thank you, Phil, for again coming on here. Uh, thanks for all the listeners for checking them out. Um, and as always, support independent wrestling. Whatever happened to-
to you. And we're back with Whatever Happened To, the segment where we catch up on some often overlooked names from Midwest Wrestling's past. I'm Mike Isaacs, and today we're chatting with the California Kid. How are we doing today? Great, Mike. Nice to be on, man. Oh, absolutely. It's it's fantastic to finally get you on here. Uh, for those who don't know, a little behind the scenes, uh, Ike Isaacs has the worst memory on earth. I had an interview with him, and I literally forgot about it. Felt so bad about it. I was like, I was like, Dave, you need to reschedule. You need to call him up. We need to get this rescheduled. Um, but we got it rescheduled. We got him on the line. It's it's the world is good. <laughs> but <laughs> we'll just go ahead and jump right into it. Um, the most important question of all: how, Tell us how you got started in uh, wrestling. Wow, I tell you, that was a long time ago. I was uh, about 17 years old. I was in high school, and a local independent group came to my local town here where I live uh, in southern Illinois. And uh, I just, uh, the first person I saw was Madman Pondo. And I'm sure our listeners all know who Pondo is. And uh, he made such an impression on me. Um, you know, that, that a guy who before, in my opinion, was before his time because, uh, you didn't see anybody going out flipping the bird until the attitude era with Stone Cold Steve Austin. Well, Madman Pondo was doing this back in 1989, 1990. So, uh, when I saw him and then they had these flyers here, you know, want to get into the exciting world of professional wrestling. I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta get in with these guys. You know, I mean, these characters that I saw were, were, uh, you know, just like on television, you know, it was like WWE only it was in my hometown. And, uh, uh that was kind of what, uh, sparked my interest. And I, I sent that letter in and, and, uh, started training with a local, uh, group down here in Southern Illinois, uh, with a guy by the name of Bud Chaplin, who's passed away since then. Uh, I learned a lot from him. Uh, learned a lot from a guy by the name of Howard Brackney, who later on went to WCW as the super ninja in Ricky the Dragon. Steamboat's corner of all the wrestling curious remember that angle. Um, so uh, both of those guys are gone, but I, I learned a lot from them. And uh, I tell you, most of my training, though, was done in the ring, on the job, uh, with guys like the hustler Rip Rogers, who's a legend over there in Indiana, you know. Uh, I learned so much from him, so much from uh, George Weingroff, uh, who, who did the Sheik angle, uh, Dutch Mantel. Uh, so, I mean, I had a lot of in-ring, on-the-job training. Oh, yeah. And you know, Rip Rogers, a friend of the show, is an eclectic character, I'll tell you. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, I all, it was always a pleasure working with Rip. I learned so much from him uh, in the ring and out of the ring, psychology-wise. And, I mean, uh, today with social media, I see Rip Rogers doing so much for the talent that's out there today, continuing to teach him and pass on uh, some of the old-school uh, psychology of professional wrestling, and I, I think that's just great. No, absolutely, yeah. That was actually a really big thing when we were talking to him. He was all about the psychology, and he was – we always ask the question, you know, it's like, um, uh, what do you think about professional wrestling these days? And boy, did he have some words. <laughs> boy, did he have some words. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, but that's actually a good question to pose to you. I mean, you you were definitely you were trained in a different era. Uh, you were around, like you said, some people who, you know, listeners nowadays, they will probably know who they are. But a lot of them didn't grow up with them. They didn't. They weren't around them that much. Um, so, kind of just a, a short comparison. Like, what do you think about your day of wrestling compared to like the modern style? Well, I tell you, I'm. I just don't watch it as much as I used to. Um, it's 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 just not the same product. I mean, it, it's something that I love, and it will never go away. Um, but, uh, I mean, man, I, I think I was in it at a really good time. You know, I, I started out there, um, in 1990 as a 17 year old kid. And, uh, I ended up, uh, retiring officially in 2002, uh, right before my youngest son was about to be born. And, uh, I mean, I've seen a lot, man. I, I was in the midst of the, the attitude era and that was great. You know, I mean, we, uh, I would have matches with, uh, Gator McAllister and, and Brandon Walker and, and numerous others. I actually wrestled under the name of Brett Gunn because I look so much like Billy Gunn in, in a lot of parts of the country. I held uh, uh, Hoosier Pro Wrestling's Heavyweight Championship. I, I was their first champion up there as Brett Gunn uh, for Jerry Wilson. So, 
Yeah, no, I mean, I was in it at a really great time, and uh, I mean, I wouldn't change any of that for for anything in the world, all the money in the world. I tell you, it was it, it was a blessing. Absolutely, it's funny, you know, you mentioned Gator McAllister. I, I think I literally interviewed him like last Wednesday, I think. <laughs> Another really cool oh, guy. Really? Yeah, oh, yeah, great man. He's really cool. Yeah. He'll be on here soon. Oh. Uh, I guess sneak peek for people who didn't know that. <laughs> but he's a really yeah, well, cool guy. Well, that's cool. Uh, yeah, me and him are headed down to New Orleans next uh, next month for WrestleMania weekend. A lot of the guys that we've worked with on the Independence, uh, the Bushwhackers and, and Brutus Beefcake and, and all those guys that uh, – uh, we wrestled with on the Indies are, are going to be down there for WrestleCon. We're going to go down there and uh, uh, party on Bourbon Street with some of the boys. So I'm looking forward to that. No, absolutely. That sounds amazing. That's another cool thing, you know, it's like, you know, WrestleMania, you can just go to go. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I, I can't imagine that that won't be a party and a half. I talked to Gator and he, he, he seems he seems pretty into it. So he, I'm sure you guys will have a lot of fun. <laughs> Oh, absolutely, man. We we don't even have to be WrestleMania weekend, and me and Gator have a blast. So right. uh, I could tell you some stories on that. I tell you New Year's Eves and, and hotel stays and everything else. <laughs> but that that alone, I can, I can imagine those stories. Uh, well, if you don't mind, tell, tell us a funny story. I mean, you probably have worked with so many people. You've been to so many places, and you probably have a billion and one stories. Uh, but we love hearing funny oh, stories. Oh, yeah. Uh, you have any like really good ones that come off the top of your head? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, th- those hotel parties. I mean, we we would have so much fun. We used to do uh, TV tapings for American Pro Wrestling in Vincennes, Indiana, uh, once a month. And uh, me and Pondo, I mean, we were notorious. You know, we uh, there was another group down there called the Barroom Brawlers, and I was sharing a room with a, a guy named Jeff Rocket, and. Uh, these barroom and Jeff Rocket had this girl in there with him, you know, and stuff. And, and Pondo come knocking at the door with uh, <clears throat> this huge tag team called the Barroom Brawlers, and and I just let him on in, you know, I was like, come on in, you know, guys, let's have a beer, you know, let's have some fun. And and Jeff wasn't really up for that because he had this girl, you know, there with him and stuff. And the Barroom Brawlers just stepped up on the bed with Jeff and then this you know, this lady friend of his, you know, just sitting there watching TV and just kind of kicked him in the rear end, kicked him over the side, you know, and Jeff was afraid of these barroom brawlers, right? And so me and Pondo were just kind of laughing and we thought it was funny. And they ended up taking this girl's clothes and Jeff's clothes and throwing them up in the trees out into the atrium out by the pool, you know, where they didn't have any clothes. And it was just, just silly things like that, you know, that grown people are doing, you know, to entertain themselves while they're out there on the road, you know. <laughs> that definitely sounds like that sounds like a heck of a story. I, you know, I'd probably be the unlucky guy that got my clothes thrown up in the uh, in the tree, so I'd have to you know take my stark naked ass down there and <laughs> climb a tree or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, ma'am. Another one. Uh, if you guys are friends with Rip on the show, I mean, uh, there was one time, and, and I tell you what, nobody in the locker room laughed. But now that it's past tense, I can laugh about it a little bit because I wanted to at the time, but. I remember Rip walking across a dressing room and getting one of those hostess uh, fried pies out of a vending machine. And he's walking across the dressing room like only Rip does, you know, with that style. And uh, Gator McAllister had just wetted his hair with a water bottle. So there was this water bottle or water on the floor, and Rip hit that water and just did a bump right there in the middle of the dressing room. And uh, all he said was, GD, my my pies ruined. I, I I can imagine. I think someone. I, can, I, I think I've heard someone tell me a story like one time before that he walked out to the ring eating like a chili cheese dog or something like that. I think it I, wouldn't surprise me. I uh, <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't put anything past Rip. Right. That's what I was gonna say. I think I, I cannot remember who told me that story, but someone told me he just walked out to the ring with the chili cheese dog, and I guess the promoter was like, "What are you doing?" And he's like, "Oh." eating a chili cheese dog what do you think i'm doing so i, I feel like he probably puts <laughs> food at pretty high regard <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i mean uh, i mean and it's these these are the kind of stories that always crack me up because like especially when i've gotten to talk to these people it's always like funny to you know put some pieces together and like make a really weird like connection but uh i mean yeah 
and these are just some of the great things about wrestling too. It's like you get to go to these random places with these random people, and then these things just transpire. Um, but what are some more of your fond memories about wrestling, about the business? You know, what other things is it that you remember about wrestling that you may miss? Oh, I tell you, I mean, it was, it was really always about the fans, about the people, you know, um, going town to town. And especially when you would run those towns once or twice a month, you know, you, you kind of almost thought of them as extended family, you know, they, it was more than just, uh, going to a town and seeing if you can, you know, sell, sell merchandise or than that. It was more than the pop that they gave you when you came out. I mean, it, they're the ones that made it, uh, so worth doing, you know, because back then, uh, we did some of the hardcore stuff, you know, and things like that. And, uh, I pretty much abused my body on, a, on several occasions, you know, and, uh, I, I, I did that for the fans and, uh, it was worth it. It was worth it. No, absolutely. Yeah. That's what a lot of people say is, you know, it's, it's about the fans, you know, and that's, that's one of those things too, is that wrestling is such a fan driven industry. It's really is, you know, they're the ones that, uh, that keep that paycheck coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. That's for sure. I'm, a, I'm actually uh, going to do a show next month. I haven't done one in a few years because, uh, you know, I, I try to stay away from it, but, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, hell, Roddy Piper, he, uh, how many times did he retire, you know, Yeah. and, uh, came back. But, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's in your blood and it's there to stay. And, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I got a couple more left in me, so I'm going to do one next month here locally. And, uh, I'm kind of looking forward to getting back in there, even if it is just for a few minutes and, uh, and, uh, get a taste of it. Absolutely. And before we move on, uh, I guess, uh, shameless self-promotion, uh, what show is it? Where's it going to be at? Um, it's going to be at uh, Roadhouse Harley Davidson in Mount Vernon, Illinois, uh, middle of next month. I think it's around the seventeenth or so. Uh, it'll be after we get back from WrestleMania, and uh, I'm going to be wrestling uh, some guys that they they have local there. Uh, his name's the Raging Redneck. I don't know much about him other than he's just a local guy that's uh, been kind of running his mouth on some of the social media about me and being old and past my prime and and washed up so i'm gonna go out there and uh just see what he's bringing to the table absolutely those are fighting words i'll tell you <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm not trying to cut a promo here but i tell you you know and when somebody calls you old and washed up and uh uh you know they they better be ready to back that one up <laughs> no absolutely I, I agree if they're if they're gonna they either need to put up or they need to shut up that's what it is uh, there's, there's no, there's no, no problem with putting that little promo out there. Uh, obviously we'll probably talk about it a little bit later, but check it out. Definitely. You probably want to see him get in the ring and, uh, kick some red, I, I guess literally a redneck's ass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But, you know, kind of along with that, you know, um, you know, obviously you mentioned that you kind of retired early two thousands, right before your, your uh, child was born. That's right. So, what yeah. have you kind of been doing in the meantime uh otherwise i mean obviously i'm sure you have a day job but anything else that you've been doing any other hobbies that you kind of partake in yeah actually um i uh speaking of the roadhouse harley davidson uh i work for a harley De davidson dealership down in marion illinois uh it's called black diamond harley davidson it's one of the uh biggest uh, volume dealers in the region and uh so yeah i uh, i've always enjoyed motorcycles i've always been a harley guy always rode one and uh now i get to uh help people get on one uh you know it's it's a lot of people's lifetime dream to own a harley davidson you know and when they get their first one i can be a part of that sometimes and uh there's a lot of satisfaction in that i'm, I'm enjoying what i'm doing and uh yeah it's uh it's rewarding it really is Oh, absolutely. You know what they say. If you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Heck, I get to ride motorcycles around all day, you know, and, and get paid for it. So it's great. Hey, you know, I can't complain about that. I too like motorcycles. You know, I don't know if the if, uh, if my significant other would ever ever let me get a motorcycle, but I love them nonetheless. I, it's they're awesome. They're amazing. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> well, if you get her approval, you know who to call now. <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. I do. I know exactly who need who I need to go to. <laughs> I'll to be like, be like, hey, you know, you want to hook me up? <laughs> get Dave to send you a message <laughs> on Facebook. 
Yeah, heck yeah. As a matter of fact, over the weekend, I just sold one to a kid, and uh, he come in there, and he was looking at me kind of funny, and uh, I had him sold on it the whole way through, and he went back in there to finance, and, and then he finally told the finance guy, he's like, man, that guy looks familiar. You know, uh, have I seen him somewhere before? And the guy was like, yeah, we get that regularly. That used to be the California kid. He used to be a wrestler. And then it just clicked, you know. So, And this guy was from Kentucky. I've had it happen from people over in Indiana and here in Illinois. And it's just like the whole Midwest. I can I can cut off my hair and I can get a little more tattoo work done, but people still recognize me as that character, the California kid. And uh, that guy come out of finance, and he was just like, oh, man, I tell you, I, I used to watch you when I was a kid, you know, which makes me feel old. But, you know, it made me feel good, too, you know, that uh, somebody still remembers me and uh, had a good time watching down there at the Boonville Fairgrounds whenever I would go work down there and Evansville Coliseum and when I would put on, you know, uh, a match there, you know. So, uh, yeah, I, I still get recognized even at my day job sometimes, so. <laughs> That's awesome. That's, 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 I think that's part of like, that's part of the great things about, you know, doing that kind of thing is, you know, you still get a little bit of recognition, you know, it's, it's not like super extreme where, you know, you're getting swarmed every day, but you get those people that come by and they have, you know, really good stories to tell you about it. And I, I've heard, I hear that from a lot of guys they are like, you know, we love it. We love it. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, it's, it's, it's nice to get that. Sometimes it feels like a compliment. Now back in, uh, 1999 and 2000, whenever uh, I'm doing good and almost getting a contract with WWE, you know, it, it was like it, locally I would go somewhere and it uh, it was almost like I was already that celebrity, you know. Uh, people would come up to you and want to shake your hand when you've got a, a sandwich in your hand. It's like, geez, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's not like that anymore. And as I look back on that stuff, you know, um, you know, maybe I took some of that time for granted and and, uh, and everything, but uh, now that I look back on it, I, I appreciate it, and I'm grateful that uh, I got to do all that. So, Absolutely. And that was also something I was going to ask you about before we get too, too far into the uh, the day-to-day. You know, obviously, you know, there you, you mm-hmm. kind of uh, you look back at your career, see all the things, and that was actually something I wanted to ask you about. You mentioned you almost had a contract with uh, the WWE. Um Tell us about that. Tell us about that experience, if you would. Yeah. Well, as we talked about, I mean, uh, back in the late 90s, uh, things were a lot different than they are now. You know, yeah. there was no developmental center. There was no tough enough TV show, uh, stuff like that. So um, I actually got recognized on the independence. Um, I got a call from Terry Taylor, the Red Rooster, uh, who was uh, working in the office there at uh, WWE at the time? And I, I, you know, I thought it was a prank phone call. I, I kept number, you know, out of the phone books and things. This was before cell phones back then, and uh, uh, because I was always having, I was always being approached about training people, wanting to get into the business, and I never did that. Um, so whenever I, I got a phone call, and this guy said he was Terry Taylor on the other end, I was like, what? You know well, Scott's not here, you know, and, and he was like, oh, okay, we'll have him call me. And it was a Stanford, Connecticut phone number, you know. And uh, so anyway, I, I talked to Terry, and he said, man, you've got a good look about you. Uh, we've got to hold a couple of your tapes here, uh, which I've been wrestling uh, some main events. Uh, I wrestled Jake the Snake Roberts, the Honky Tonk Man, and, and stuff like that. And uh, word kind of got around. And uh, anyway, they invited me to Kansas City, Missouri, uh, to do a dark match on the first SmackDown TV taping, uh, which I wrestled Kurt Angle, and uh, we had a beautiful match. We really did. Uh, great match. Uh, actually, Kurt was more uh, nervous than what I was because he was only three years into the business, and I was like 13 years into the business, you know? So, but uh, no, nope, had a good match. I got a handful of compliments and was uh, told to keep in touch because they didn't want me falling through the cracks. And I was brought up in the business to never go looking for work or, or badgering promoters for work. So I just kind of sat back and held on for two more years. And uh, when I realized I wasn't going to get the contract, and maybe that was my own fault for not, you know, being the squeaky wheel to, to get the oil. But, uh, you know, everything happens for a reason. And uh, I didn't get my contract. And in 2002, I, I decided to hang it up. So no regrets, you know. uh uh, it was a great experience for me. Everybody at the WWE was great. Um, I'd already met Mick Foley 
I knew Kane, um, a couple of other guys there that I worked with uh, on shows, Viscera, uh, big boss man, super nice guy, Draws, he was great. Uh, so yeah, that was that was just of my ten or twelve hours there with the superstars one day. Uh, <laughs> I I was actually there with my ex-wife and she could not watch my match back in the back in the locker room because at the same time they were taping an interview with Stone Cold Steve Austin. So that interview was the one being shown in the locker room on the TV instead of the match out into the arena. So she didn't get to see it. So <laughs> you're just like, that is, that is a damn shame. <laughs> yeah. Cause I came back. I was like, how'd it look? You know, she was like, I don't know. All I watched was Stone Cold Steve Austin, you know? And uh, I'm like, ah, well, you know. And, of course, I can't get a copy of that because they own the rights to everything. So, Of course, of course. <laughs> Maybe eventually they'll put out, like, but, a dark, uh, mac- dark match collection or something like that. Yeah, yeah, there you go. And uh, But, I, you know, when I did come back through, one guy that did watch my match and gave me a very good compliment, and that was Paul Bearer, William Moody. Um, so, I mean, as, as much as he had been around in the business, for him to take me to the side and said, Hey, I saw your match. That really looked good. That was great. You know, and, uh, Harley race, he was there. He said, uh, kid, here's my phone number. Give me a call. I can get you some work, you know? So, I mean, you know, it was, uh, it was a good match. Just, uh, you know, maybe I should have, uh, badgered him a little bit more and, uh, who knows, maybe I would, uh, would have been uh, a different situation for me, you know, but, uh, I'm good with it. No, absolutely. You know they say you gotta make gotta make peace with your life, right? You gotta gotta live with what you done, live with what you didn't, right? <laughs> yep, absolutely. So, so I'm grateful. No, absolutely, and that's that's you know that's the best way to live. You gotta be grateful for what happened, not you know you know not upset about what didn't happen or what could have been because you know that just that just makes you sour, you know, <laughs> just makes you sour. Oh yeah, yeah, and and I tell you, I'm not sour at all. Like I said, I mean that was. Those were the best years of my life and uh, met so many great people uh, that I worked with in the ring and that would go and support me and go to every match, you know, and uh, no, that was, that was, that was something that those, those, that I look back at it now and it was a very brief time in my life. And uh, I tell you, I wish it would have lasted longer. Absolutely. So kind of as, you know, kind of wrapping up, you know, there, there, you know, obviously we've talked a lot about things that you've done, you know, kind of how you, how you started, where you were during your career, kind of the, some of the things you did, some of your stories. And, you know, if you, when you look back at your career, you look at, you know, what you still have left, because like you said, you, you still wrestle some, you still have matches that are coming up even, but when you look at everything in perspective, mm-hmm. um, what do you want someone who watched you during your career? What would you want to impart upon somebody who's watched you during your career? What do you want your legacy to be? Wow. Um, you know, I think I want my legacy to be, uh, a guy who, uh, enjoyed doing what he was doing, uh, still remained a very important part of his children's lives while he was doing it. Um, I mean, there were many weekends where, I took my two oldest, which were, you know, very young at the time with me, you know, every weekend on the road. And, uh, you know, a lot of their, their weekends with dad were spent in a, a national guard armory or a bingo hall at the gimmick table, selling my pictures and, and, and things. And, uh, I think that that's what my legacy I can be proud of, you know, is that, uh, I got to do this and I got a good relationship with my family after I stopped doing it, you know? So uh, a lot of the guys that uh, went on to get contracts, you know, if, if that would happen to me, maybe, maybe that wouldn't be the same story for me. My family or something, uh, you just never know. So, so there, how's that? That, that? that is fantastic. So last question for you, you know, I'm um, not sure if there is, but uh, you know, social media is, you know, prevalent these days, as we kind of mentioned, uh, is there, is there any way uh-huh. fans can keep up with you, keep up with what you're doing and, uh, follow you on the interwebs? Well, I tell you what, there is a Facebook and, uh, you can find that page at the California kid.com or, uh, that Facebook, the California kid, just search that name and, uh, you can find my page there. I actually, they, they booted me off of there once because they, they changed their, their, uh, 
stuff as far as what names you could use and things like that. And uh, But uh, I may not be able to respond from that website, but that's a site that you can go to and, and, and see all the stuff that I've done and been a part of and people that I've worked with. And uh, other than that, you know, I mean, it's a shoot everybody knows. I mean, it's on the, a lot of the, the old dirt sheets and stuff. My real name is Scott Little. Um, I'm on Facebook as well. I've got a lot of fans on there from from all over the Midwest. My real name, so I mean, I'm comfortable with that. Uh, Scott Little on Facebook. You're welcome to hit me up, friend me there, and uh, if you want to buy a bike, you can uh, let me know there, and I'll take care of you on that end too. How about that? There, there you go. You got you not only do you get to keep up with the California kid. If you want a motorcycle, you got you got your foot in the door already. <laughs> <laughs> all right well look uh i want to just thank you very much for you know taking the time talking to us today you know it took us a little bit to get it arranged but we appreciate you being flexible with us working with us and coming on here you know it's been a pleasure hearing all your stories and uh getting to know you a little bit better but i do really want to thank you for coming on here today well hey i appreciate it too it's been a pleasure uh talking to you guys and uh uh, I'll be listening to it after you release it, and uh, hopefully I will uh, listen to a few of my other buddies that uh, get on there and, uh, and and be a part of your podcast. Come crack open a cold one and let Old Mancer tell you a story. King of big dog style, Larry to light beer, the king of the trailer court, your favorite wrestler of mine, me. This is Warner's Wisdom with Mance Warner. All right, people, here we go. Old Master back here one more time on the Dave Dynasty Show. Jesus Christ Almighty, I forgot to turn the damn oven on as I'm getting ready to talk to y'all on here. I'm sorry. Cooking up a nice pizza on a Sunday. Got my light beer in the fridge. I'm going to bust one open on here. Old Master. Oh, look at this right here. Helen over here watching me. She mad. She looking at me. She angry. She knew the pizza wasn't cooking, but that's how she gets, gets back at me now. If I don't give her her treats when she wants them, she watches me stumble around drunk, and I don't do things right, and she just laughs her ass off. Ain't that right, Helen? Oh, I love you, Helen. I know. Okay, I got my pizza cooking right here. Turned it on. Got my light beer. Filming a podcast here. Let me get into this intro real quick here. Oh, it's good light beer. All right, people. King of big dog style. Larrington light beer. Sutter Psycho. Master of the pop-up headbutt. Knee pad up. Knee pad down, dramatic paws, dramatic paws, the two-time, two-time IWA Miss Out World Heavyweight Champion, King of the Trailer Court, Old Man, sir. I think I got all the nicknames on there right there. If not, I'll, I'll work back to them. That's what we do on the on the podcast out here, baby. Old Man, sir, going to keep this short and sweet out here. On the best part of the Day Dynasty Show, Old Man, sir, I get out here, I ramble, I talk, I go on a tangent, I forget what I was talking about. We work back to it. That's what we do out here, people. Now, uh, you know, there's there's dramatic pauses every time Old Man, sir, taking a swig out his light beer. Now, here's the deal. Busy weekend, all over the place, on the road. My truck's acting up. Old Man, sir, sad, man. I'm sad out here. My truck's starting to, I can't get it reversed, y'all. I almost got trapped in the damn Dollar General parking lot. Cause my truck, I just drive it so much on Thursday through Sunday, the shows, baby. Old Messer, my, my old truck dying, man. I'm gonna, I'll keep y'all updated. I'll let you know tomorrow what's going down. I love that truck, baby. Now, okay. I'm gonna get into it. Another edition of Warner Wisdom right here. Old Messer, get out here. I spit out some knowledge. Y'all take it if you want to. I leave it on the table. I walk away. Y'all decide what you do with it after that moment right there. Okay. Here deal. Nowadays, pro wrestling turned into a, 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 it's a lot of maneuvers, a lot of moves, a lot of guys going out hitting moves. It's all about moves, baby. Old Messer disagrees. Old Messer disagrees with that logic. You go out there and hit all the dips and dives and flips, whirly birds, all the deals you want to hit. There's one maneuver that will change the swing of a match, the momentum. Who's on top, baby? Who's, who's bringing the heat? Who's putting the boots to someone at that moment? So when guys are hitting 450s, they're hitting Phoenix splashes, they're hitting Phoenix elbow drops, they're hitting top rope cold breakers. Is that a maneuver? Cold, top rope cold breaker. If not, someone needs to take that. Old man just gave you one, baby. Now, the one thing y'all need to watch out for, the one maneuver the old man's are always preaching about. They call Old Messer a God, baby. They call Old Messer the I Pope God. And that's exactly what y'all need to, need to write down right now. Get a piece of paper out. Get a pen. Get a crown. Get a marker. 
get a get a a uh, hell, I don't know, a nice jagged stone out of the out of the garden out there if you want to. You got a garden with what the hell just ran by the door right here. Jesus Christ it. Could have been an alien. Could have been an alien right here. I ain't gonna lie to y'all. I'm pretty sure I saw me a creature run by Helen. You ready? I told you this moment was coming, sister. Watch out by that door. I'm going to get this light beer, check on this pizza, and come back, and we're going to be good to rock and roll. The maneuver old Messer was talking about was an eye poke. A simple but effective maneuver. Old Messer has been using it since 1983, and I've won. Many, many contests. Got many, many W's. Hit many, many pay windows. An eye poke. It's simple. It's effective. But not all can master it. A lot of people try. Ain't no one got it down like old Messer, baby. Well, MJF pretty good. I give him that. MJF pretty good with the eye poke too. Some people say there's eye poke God. Some people say there's eye poke gods with an S at the end of it. MJF, old master, y'all decide. The mega power is the eye poke, maybe. I don't know. But the one maneuver, this is my knowledge for this week. Try it out and it, try it out when you go to bank. Try it out when you go to, to work. Try it out with, you know, you get home from work. And your kid's giving you hell. You know, just try this maneuver out. Maybe you're at the gas station. Someone running up on you. Maybe they're going to try to rob you. Maybe they got a weapon. Maybe maybe you ain't got that pepper spray on you that your old lady gave you. Because your old lady knows you're out there getting mugged all the time and you can't defend yourself. So, try to, try to eye poke out there. Old mess are going to make me... Hold on, Helen. I told you, hey, we ain't seen him yet. They, we looking out the window. Ain't no aliens yet. I thought I saw one. Pretty sure. We'll check back on it, Helen. Old Messer gonna make y'all a defense video where I'm gonna show you a couple moves. The one you're gonna really need to pay attention to is the eye poke. This eye poke is gonna save your life, brother. I'm telling you. Brother, sister, kids, anyone. Y'all need to get the eye poke down on Messer gonna go. Gonna put the, the DVD out or the Blu-ray or maybe what, can, can you stream stuff too? You need to talk to old Powerbomb TV. Old Messer gonna make y'all, I'm saying it right now, we'll figure it out later. That's what Old Messer does. I just say things and we get to it down the road. Old Messer gonna make y'all a defense video about eye pokes. I'm gonna train y'all in the Southern Psycho style trailer court ass kicking, baby. Right there. We're gonna figure that out. I'll talk to Powerbomb. Y'all, y'all, Tweet it, retweet it, share it, like it, whatever that's called. Now, I'm going to get off here. I got this pizza cooking. Helen's getting riled up. We saw these damn aliens out here in the trailer court. Now, I'm going to get off here. Y'all, like it, share it on the Day Dicey Show, on the Twitter, on the Instagram, on the Facebook, on the Sandy Cloud, on the iTunes, on the whatever the hell else there is out there at this point. <clears throat> I don't know no more. Now, old mess is getting off here. Helen, let's go whoop some of this alien ass out here. You ready? She ready to rock and roll. She's all hopped up. Okay. Old Manchester getting off here. Until next time, y'all have a good week. Ain't going to be as good as Old Manchester's. I'll keep you updated on my truck. Lord, be with us now. This truck, my God, I love it. I love a truck, but maybe it's time for a change, you know? Maybe it's time for a change. I can't sit here and, and bitch and moan. I'm alive. I'm breathing. I got my lot beers. Got a pizza in here. Got my cat, Helen. I'm looking at you, Helen. Uh, you know, that's just, maybe it's time for a change. I'll keep y'all updated. I'll get that, that DVD rocking and rolling. We'll ship some out. See right there. I was eye poking and I forget sometimes I'm on a podcast and not getting filmed. Now, old messer, I'll get off here. Y'all have a good one. I love y'all. And we are back on the Dave Dynasty show. I am Dave Dynasty. Thank you for joining us this week. Hopefully you enjoyed the episode, the interview with Phil Nitro Monahan. Whatever happened to the California kid? Uh, the classic Scott Steiner intro as we continue our quest for Steiner. And, of course, the official decision with a referee man by an, and the return of Mance Warner with some Warner's wisdom. Uh, he's got me uh, got me craving pizza now. Pizza and beer, right? Sounds sounds good. Thanks, Mance. Uh, again, visit DaveDynasty.com to find all of our social media links. And while you're out there in the world, if you would like to make an ongoing contribution to the show, you can do that through patreon.com slash the Dave Dynasty. Or if you'd like to make a one-time contribution through PayPal, you can do that at paypal.me slash the Dave Dynasty. Uh, those things help. We do put a lot of time into the show, right? You know, I mean, Ike does most of the interviews. Uh, I do the intros and outros, but and all the editing. And it takes time, right? It takes time to put this together, to gather the uh, 
the audio clips that we use to track these guys down to schedule these interviews. Uh, it takes some wacky hours, a lot of time to put it together. Um, you know, and, we, and I'm fine investing that time into it. I enjoy doing it. I enjoy doing it for everybody. Uh, but, you know, help us out to keep it free and uh, support, uh, the re- you know, as we replace equipment, etc. Uh, we, like I guess I've got a new mic that I'm, I'm still tinkering with. I know the sound's not, not perfect yet. I'm still playing with it, trying to figure it out, uh, how it works. Uh, and the adjustments, I, I will get there. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not real nutty uh, with the sound. Uh, so it takes some time for me to figure it out, but we will figure it out. But once again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your support. Thank you for sharing and uh, con- contributing. Thanks for all the messages and feedback we get online. Uh, we, in coming weeks, uh, we've got interviews coming up with Joey Dice. Uh, coming up, we will have another installment of Graham's Gallery with Dr. Jerry Graham Jr. Uh, more WWA history. WWA, did I put the WWA there? More WWA history uh, that I'm going to sit down with some people and talk with. And we're going to begin our series of shows on uh, some AWA topics in history. It should be fun stuff. Good things. We'll have more whatever happens to more man's wonders, more referee amendments, all the stuff you love. Keeping piles of Midwest goodness every week for you. And until then, make sure you're getting out there supporting independent pro wrestling in your area. All the local groups. Get to a show. Buy a shirt. Uh, support these guys. Shake their hands. Tell them you appreciate it. Remember, these guys depend on you to make a living. So, uh, you know, go hit these guys up. You know, many of them have pro wrestling teach stores. Uh, you know, buy a, sh- buy a shirt, uh, contact them, uh, and, and help them out, right? Help them, help them chase this dream. Hey, we have a pro wrestling teach store. Buy a shirt from us. But until next week, I am Dave Dynasty. Until then, be good, be safe, and keep on growing. <laughs> 